The 14th day of Rabi' al-Awwal happens to be the passing of our master Imam Malik, the student of Imam Nafi, the student of uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, the direct student of our master, and the son of our master, <coughs> Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar al-Khattab, who was the direct student and the companion of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The 17th day is the birth of our master Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who was the teacher the inner path for our four Imams, the student of Muhammad al-Bakr, the son of Imam Muhammad al-Bakr, Bakr Imam Hussein, a direct great-great-grandson of the Prophet buried in Baqi. As a small child, it's narrated about him that he used to spend a significant amount of time with animals. And one of his karamas that some of, the, some of the people around him would say that he had an incredible ability of actually communicating with them, and what he would communicate with them was how to make sajda to God. He would teach animals how to make sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 17th day also happens to be a few years ago, marking the day that religious zealots, people with no understanding of our deen, decided to destroy the maqam and the most beautiful tree of the, our master Imam Nawawi. This is a day that we should really be contemplating. People that have hausa, an imbalance in their understanding because of a lack of dhikr, because of a lack of fiqh in their deen. An understanding in their deen destroyed a blessed place where Imam Nawawi had been sleeping for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The 18th day is the birth of Bibi Umm Kulthum ibn Ali. She was the fourth child of Sayyidina Ali and Bibi Fatima Zahra. She was given in marriage by our master Imam Ali to Amir al Mu'minin, Sayyidina Umar al Khattab. She bore him two children. Zayd and Nuqayyah. This is a union, a blessed union, between the daughter, the, grand, the immediate granddaughter of our Prophet Sallallahu and Sayyidina Umar. The 26th day was the death of Abu Talib, the father of Imam Ali. This happens to be, like I mentioned, a blessed occasion. This is a beautiful month. This is the month of Hijrah. This is the month of the Mawlid. This is the month in which our Prophet ﷺ married our mother, Bibi Khadija, who bore him six children. This is the building, <laughs> this is the month where the first Masjid of Islam was built, Masjid Quba. And we know about Masjid Quba that if a person is to make wudu and go to the, to the Masjid and perform two cycles of prayer, they get the reward of performing an Umrah. And according to Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim and Imam Ahmad, he would go regularly on Saturdays to visit Masjid Qubba. This is our history. And this is where we come from. And this is the foundation of our deen. And this is the foundation of our understanding of our religion. You can't argue with history. So, Surah al Awwal. And we are commanded commanded. And if you don't understand this, we have a very dis, dis, un, we have a disfigured understanding of our religion. You as a Muslim, me as a Muslim, anyone who says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam must, must, must show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and express happiness on the arrival of our Prophet ﷺ into this world. Whether you agree on standing and saying salams, whether you agree that the 12th day of Rabi' al-Awwal is the actual motive because there were some scholarly differences about whether it was the 12th or 17th or 19th, fine. It's inconsequential whether you believe that this is supposed to be something in an integrative part of our religion in terms of the actual recognition of the day. But if you don't show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the arrival of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa into this world as him being sent as rahmatan lil alameen then something is wrong with our deen in our understanding of our deen in our practice of our deen The 
this is the day where we don't do something to try to change our religion. We don't put trees in our home and decorate them in a particular way. <coughs> but it is a day where my teachers, I ask them, what's the practice of, 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 a, of a true Muslim on the Mawid of the Prophet What are we supposed to do? And I was quoted from Ibn Hajar. My teacher said, Ibn Hajar said that every single day of your life is a celebration of the arrival of the Prophet I was taught as a child, literally, we did a celebration of the motives of the Prophet every single month, every single week, every single opportunity that we had as a family gathering, we did we gathered and we and we beautified our gathering with salawat upon the Prophet. So I asked, my Mashaif, my teachers told me, this is the time to fast. This is the time to recite Quran al Kareem. This is the time to visit family members on this day. This is the day for extra prayers. Every single birthday I had, whether you believe in birthdays or don't believe in birthdays, this is what my mother taught me. Whether you believe in celebrating a Western birthday or, a, or an Eastern birthday or a Hijri birthday or whatever type of birthday you decide to celebrate, my mother always taught me, whenever you do any special recognition, you can have a cake and a this and a that, and you can do those things. She said what's most important is you stop and do two raka'at at the beginning of your day and show shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thank Him for giving you life. And thank Him for giving you all the ni'mah that was sent into your life. And ask Him to increase you in your remembrance and your shukr and your practice of the sunnah of the Prophet That's what I did. All the time. And they said this was the time to read some sirah. Because Muslims don't know. When Habib Omar came and gave, blessed us in this masjid with the gathering, that same evening we sat with him and he asked the children in the room, <coughs> name the six children of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Name his kunya back to Adnan. Name his in-laws. You have to know your Prophet. We know the members of our family. Like we know our own children, we know their names, we know their birthdays, we know their likes, we know their dislikes. But now we find ourselves on the 12th day of Rabi al-Awwal, and we have to take the opportunity to get to know the Messenger of Allah Who was he? How did he look? How did he practice his religion? Because if we're going to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which should be our first and primary goal in our lives, to return to Him with good akhlaq, to return to him, sallallahu so to return to him, subhanahu wa taala, with qalb salim. Then there's no better path than the way of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We're only going to enter into the presence of Allah through, as we know, the du'a after the adhan, nil wasiyata, through the intercession, through the practice, through the sunnah of our Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is the day for us to seriously contemplate as Muslims as fathers, as mothers, as children, as youth, as older people, whoever we are, what are we going to do to get closer to the Prophet and to his practice and to understanding his sunnah? Even if it means just sitting down to drink water and not standing. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَأَشْكُرُونِي وَلَا تَأْكُرُونِ So remember me, and I will remember you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said this. And be grateful to me, and do not disobey me. So that's kudu. We don't attribute characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our Prophet. He's not Allah. We don't worship Him. We don't do our prayers to Him. We do prayers upon Him, sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. We try to connect ourselves to the salawat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angels are sending upon Him. <coughs> but we're remembering Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and showing gratitude to Him. And who was the greatest of the daqideen, the greatest of the people who remember? Our Prophet, sallallahu 
And we also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connects his commandments and his obedience to obedience and the commandments of our Prophet Obey Allah and obey the Messenger of God. So it's incumbent upon us, imperative, over the course of our spiritual aspirations, over the course of our spiritual careers and our lives, to try to practice the Sunnah of our Prophet and do as he commanded and try to stay away from the things that he, that he, he asked us to stay away from. Like I said, <coughs> even just sitting and drinking water. Ibn Ta'ala, and so we, this is what he says in reflection upon this verse. He says, if you want the door of hope, if you want the door of hope opened up for you, he said, then consider what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is coming from Him to you. Look at all the things that come from Him to you, and then your hope opens up. And Imam Ali Karimullah Wajah says, opening just a trickle, just a trickle of gratitude will open the floodgates. So if we just consider our ability to blink, our ability to hear, if anyone has ever been into the middle of the desert, you will actually show gratitude for having nose hair. <coughs> you will show gratitude for having hair in your ears. Because the dust is so profuse. You will show gratitude for being able to blink or being able to relieve yourself. Being able to seriously feel things in your body. The ability to feel hands, uh, nerve endings in your fingertips. This is all ni'mah from Allah. Even the ability to feel pain. Ni'mah. The ability that you actually, when something's wrong, your body tells you what's wrong so you can do something about it. Ni'mah from ni'mah to love. He says, but if you want the door of sadness to open up for you, then consider what goes from you to him. Because whatever we do, if we were to expend every moment of our lives, if we were to expend every single penny of our wealth, if we were to sacrifice every single thing that we had in this world for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it still wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough. And if there's anyone that disagrees with me, please talk to me after the khutbah. We could literally give up every single thing that we have been given as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it would not be enough. We know the story, the beautiful story of the person that spent over, you know, his whole entire life in a remote area simply milking a small plant, engaging in a little bit of uh, eating, and then engaging the rest of his time in doing dhikr and then prayer. And he's asked, You're admitted to Jannah by my, by my Rahmah. He said, But not by my deeds? And then, then the, the Hisab is shown all the good deeds versus all of the Ibadah, and the good deeds outweigh. So, in honor of the Mawlid of the Prophet ﷺ, we should also take into a small account, something small from Sayyid Muhammad Al bin Malik. Rahimullah, who had the chance of sitting with him on many occasions. One of the greatest scholars of our time. His father was the Imam of the Haram Sharif in Mecca before the current regime came and changed things. He was one of the greatest scholars, literally, of our time. Rahimullah. He compiled this list um, and he compiled it in many of his sources, come from Ibn Qayyum and Ibn Hajar al Haytham. But he talks about the benefits of doing salawat because one of the things that he told me to do today is do lots of salawat upon the Prophet, especially during Ramadan Salawat, during this month. And the benefits of doing salawat upon the Prophet, so number one, he said, it's responding to the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Azab. Number two, you're following the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels. Number three, Ten blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reach the person who's doing salawat upon him even one time. And ten degrees are raised 
and 10 good deeds are entered into his account and 10 bad deeds are erased by simply reciting Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina It is a dua that is always accepted no matter who is reciting it You could be a Muslim, you could be a non-Muslim, you could be anyone, you could be a practicing Muslim or a non-practicing Muslim. It's the only dua that's always accepted, universal acceptance. Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab used to recite his salawat at the beginning of the dua and at the end of the dua. Because if something in the beginning is accepted and the end is accepted, there's hope that everything in between is accepted as well. He said number five, it fulfills all of your worldly needs. Anything that you require of the dunya, it'll be fulfilled through salawat of the Prophet, of the Prophet Number six, it'll increase your nearness to the Prophet on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Number seven, for the person who is too poor, the person who is under Nisa, for the one who receives zakat from others, this is their opportunity of giving salawat, to recite salawat the Prophet Number eight, Know that when you say salawat upon the Prophet an angel is appointed that takes your salam directly to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he returns the blessing and the greeting to you. Number nine, it illuminates your gatherings. Number ten, he says, it helps you remember something if you forget. If you can't remember something, simply recite Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And you'll remember he said, number 11, it saved you from miserliness. Because the greatest miser is the one who doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when hearing the name of the Prophet. He says, and it refines your character and increases you in good manners. He says, and it increases your love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will help you cross the siyat on the Day of Judgment. And it is your opportunity to express your gratitude to the Prophet for everything that he's done for us. Sallallahu alayhi wa Now we'll end with this. I know we're running out of time. Imam, in honor of Imam Nawawi, because his grave, as we mentioned, on the 17th day, two years ago, was destroyed. And his teachings will not be. Imam Nawawi says, do a few things to keep your nafs in check. To control yourself. <coughs> This is the day also where you're supposed to control yourself and to show gratitude. He says, lighten the load of your stomach. Don't eat as much. This is a sunnah of the Prophet. The Prophet divided the stomach one third, one third, and one third. We all know this. Don't overeat. We just finished Thanksgiving where everyone was stuffed and you had to roll the people home. You couldn't even get into the car. And to unbuckle your belt before you left the house. Wear your spandex pants before you go to dinner. This is not the sunnah. Number two, turn to Allah for all the unforeseen circumstances when it hits you. Your cryptocurrency went to 11,000, then went down to 9,000. Okay, turn to Allah. People, I'm getting text messages, oh my God, I'm losing everything. Turn to God. I'm not saying don't invest in cryptocurrency. It might be a good thing, I don't know. Number three, stay away from situations where you're scared that you're going to enter into error. If you think you might get into a problem, stay away from it. Drive the speed limit. Waze tells you, there's a cop ahead, slow down. Listen. Number four, he says, recite lots of astaghfar. And do lots of salawat upon the Prophet In the daytime and in the nighttime. Number five, Find a knowledgeable teacher and keep his effort. Keep wudu as much as you can. It'll protect you from everything unseen. Pray on time. And pray your sunnah prayers. According to Abu Hanifa, there's 12 sunnah prayers that you should do every day. Pray the duha prayer. It's giving zakat upon every joint in your body. And you'll get the reward of an umrah. Pray six rakat between Maghrib and Isha if you can. And pray to Hajjud and Witr before Fajr. Fast on Mondays, the day that the Prophet was born, Monday. It's a good day to fast. And fast on Thursdays. 
and fast the night days, the 13th, 14th, and 15th day of every month. Recite Qur'an with presence. Imam al-Haddad says very clearly, when you recite the Qur'an, when you read the Qur'an, don't think of it as some imaginary person that Allah is addressing. When you see a commandment, implement it in your life. When you see a prohibition, implement it in your life. When you hear read a story, find the correlation in your life. He says, and lastly, do dhikr of the Prophet in the morning and in the evening. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. 